Okay, can uh, can people hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Yes, yes. loud and clear. Okay, okay. so uh, this is Economics uh, 484, Lecture 1. This is the first time I've tried this online. Um, and so uh, I'm imagining we will have some snafus as we go through here. Um, uh, Herbert, are you on? Yeah. So Herbert is our um, uh, uh, co-host. Uh, and I am trying to... Uh. Okay, Herbert, I am not finding you. Uh, but you were on, right? Yeah. I'm typing in the group chat. I am. There you are. Okay, I see how to do this now. Okay, you mean you be a co-host now. All right, uh, 10 minutes late, we'll, we'll start up. Um, as I said, Economics 484, um, my name is Greg Duncan. Um, I'm a, uh, uh, used to be a chief economist and chief statistician at Amazon. I'm a senior principal now, which means I'm doing primarily just research and I'm not managing anyone. Uh, I taught at Northwestern for a number of years in economics and statistics, Berkeley, um, uh, Duke, Caltech, some other places. Uh, I've been doing big data since 1980. I wrote a very, very early paper on that stuff. And I use this stuff all the time. So uh, one of the things uh, about this course is I'm giving you the stuff that I hope uh, uh, you will be able to take and use if you go and work for uh, an Amazon or a uh, uh, probably more like something like the Gap or Nike, uh, just because we do stuff at a, a, a kind of a much higher level. But certainly government stuff, there are a number of people who've taken this course that are 
currently working in government. And there are people that uh, are also uh, working at Amazon, though, um, uh, using some of these tools, not, not inventing them. Um, so I talk more about that as we go on. So administrative details. So uh, read chapters one through three of ISLR. ISLR means Introduction to Statistical Learning with Applications in R. Your homework, which is a, due a week from this Wednesday, but you should start on it right now, is first load R Studio in R, load the ISLR package, talks in the book how to do that, and in ISLR, do problems 2.1, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8. These are all exercises in R. And I'm trying to get you guys up and running on R as fast as possible. In the past, I taught 482. And I would teach R and 482. So most of the people already had R. I'm not assuming that uh, anymore. And then start reading the two papers by uh, Leo Bremen called Statistical Modeling the Two Cultures and the uh, paper by Galette Schmule called To Explain or Predict. Um, and these will become clearer as the course goes on. But basically, Bremen was somebody who came out uh, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and said, look, we don't need these guarantees. We don't need uh, consistency, asymptotic normality. We don't need to do Z tests, T tests, F tests. All we need to know is if I have a model and you have a model, and let's say yours is the best model on uh, paper. If I beat you when I do things out of sample every single time, and I don't care if you have the best spot on paper because I always beat you. And that led people to saying that prediction is the only thing you care about. And in particular, we'll talk about this today, uh, uh, out of sample prediction. Um, what uh, uh, Galette points out is, well, prediction's important too, but so's explanation. And the example I give on this is I'm in the elevator with Jeff Bezos. And I say, I have this incredibly cool model. It never, ever, ever makes a mistake. And what it's predicting is we're going to lose 10% uh, revenue uh, next quarter, which would be a huge amount. We're not going to learn to do that. Uh, but that would be a huge amount. And he doesn't say to me, what a cool model that never makes an error. He says, why is that happening and what can we do about it? Well, having the prediction doesn't help you with that. And so that's kind of where Schmilly comes in, uh, where Gillette comes in, talking about under what conditions you want to do one, what conditions you want to do the other. And this is a tension between machine learners and economists. It runs through everything we do. It's a tension between statisticians and machine learners. It's a tension between most people who have domain knowledge. What do I mean by domain knowledge? Uh, biotech people, uh, molecular cell biologists, uh, uh, political scientists, criminologists, economists, finance people. That's the domain knowledge. Oftentimes you'll find the machine learners don't have any domain knowledge. They have a PhD in computer science and machine learning, or maybe statist uh, undergrad statistics, PhD in computer science with machine learning em emphasis. And so uh, they will ask, I will ask them to estimate something, they will do it. And uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was first at Amazon, I asked somebody to estimate a demand curve for me. And they use some fancy method that's completely uninterpretable. We'll talk about interpretability later today. And I asked her, I said, 
could you just do something for me? Could you hold everything else constant and vary the price and tell me what happens to your predictions? And so she did that. And I said, what happens? And she goes, well, as the price goes up, the demand goes up. And I said, well, does that bother you at all? And she goes, why would that bother me? And you're sitting there going, you know, that's the first thing you learn in economics, downward slope of demand curves. And you know it's possible, theoretically, you could get an upward sloping one. But it should really bother you if you see a downward sloping one. And that's what I mean about, about having no domain knowledge uh, and why you get this sensitivity. Her response to me was, well, this is the models telling me. Uh, these are what the data are telling me. And this just means the economics is wrong. And I said, no, what this means is your model's wrong because you don't have the right things in your model. Now, we'll go through this in great detail as the course goes on. Basically, what she had was an omitted variable, and uh, it completely messed things up. <clears throat> so let's start with what is statistical learning? Part of what I'm going to do today is give you some uh, uh, different language than uh, you're used to. Um, so we'll start with data. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, data that are represented by vectors. So in this case, I have uh, an eta i, which has a component xi and a component y, where xi is a, uh, uh, I'm going to have a p vector and y is just a scalar, okay? So uh, uh, Herbert will talk about uh, vectors in uh, lab and take you through them in case you haven't seen these before, but um, we'll need a compact notation to write things down and vectors and matrices are the way to do it. I will not do much in the way of matrix computations. I will use it mostly so I don't have to write as much. Um, okay. We're interested in the joint distribution of those data. You know, in the end, that's really what we're interested in, the joint distribution of the data. And we'll talk about why that is later on. Uh, and we're interested often in the conditional distribution of y given x. And so I might be interested in, um, uh, in you uh, and all of the variables that I can observe that would define you. Uh, but more often, I'm going to be interested in something like this. Um, uh, how much do you weigh conditional on your... Uh, your gender, your ethnicity, uh, whether or not you were an athlete in high school, um, and so on. And uh, that will lead us to prediction problems later on. And so oftentimes we're interested in the conditional distribution um, of a variable given other variables. Now, I'm assuming for most of you, this is stuff you've seen before. In terms of conditional distribution, oftentimes we're interested in the conditional density. Okay, that's your bell curve if things are normal. You're interested often in the probability function or the cumulative distribution function. I'm going to draw a picture of one of those right here. And so a cumulative distribution function looks something like this. So that's one, that's zero, and it monotonically increases from zero to one. It can have uh, uh, jumps in it and the lot. <coughs> I'm assume you've seen those before. 
the density is just going to be the derivative of that. So it's going to look something like this, you know, like a normal curve. I'm sorry, I'm not very adept yet at using this pen. I just got this uh, surface today. So uh, my uh, drawing, which never was very good, is even worse. So the cumulative distribution function would be the probability that a random variable y was less than or equal to some value p conditional on x. And so in that case, I would probably want to write this as t given x, and I would make that t. Now, something that you may not have seen before is a quantile. Um, the quantile is the root of that equation. That is, I take a tau and I subtract off the cumulative distribution function. It turns out all that is is the inverse of cumulative distribution function. That is, if I have f plotted against z, I just now take z and plot it against tau, and I'm going to get a function that looks something like this. It starts at 1 and goes like that. Okay, and it turns out if you know the quantile, you know the uh, cumulative distribution function. If you know the cumulative distribution function, you know the quantile. And if you know the, the density, uh, you know uh, uh, the cumulative distribution function. So all of these things, uh, more or less, tell you the same thing. But as I will show you in the next lecture, when you look at inventory problems, the quantile becomes incredibly important. And it becomes incredibly important anytime you try and forecast. And since we use quantiles all the time, people at Nike use all the time, we might as well learn them in this course. Okay. What is a quantile? It says, what's the 99th percentile for the SATs or the GREs? You know, you got a 799, what percentile was that? That's all a quantile is telling you. So you say, what's 99th percentile? And then conditional on X, I could say for, uh, uh, for women, um, what is the 99th percentile in math? And there would be some number. And that's what quantiles tell you. Often we're going to write y as a systematic plus a random component. And you've seen this before, okay? So we have y equals f of x plus an error where this error has a zero conditional mean, okay? The error is a random component. The f of x is a set component. It is possible, though unlikely, that you can know that. It is not possible to know the random error. Let's talk about types of data. I'm going to start with something that you're uh, certainly aware of. Those are cardinal data in particular, continuous cardinal data. How much, how many pounds does this weigh? I misspelled something there. How many pounds does this weigh? Okay. Discrete cardinal. How many apples do I have? And the key thing here is if you weigh 100 pounds uh, and I weigh 200 pounds, I weigh twice as much as you do. If you have five apples and I have 10 apples, I have twice as many apples as you. That's the cardinality. And the continuous and discrete are, you know, way, uh, uh, pounds can be any real number. Apples have to be discrete. Then there are ordinal data, okay? Ordinal continuous data. 
For economists, this is utilities, as in utility functions. Okay. If you remember, utility functions just give you a ranking of things. For example, on a scale of one to 10, how do you feel today? Okay. 10 is not twice as good as five. It just means you're feeling better than the guy who's five. Okay. Discreet. A ranking. Okay. Who's the tallest? Who's the next tallest? Who's the next tallest? And so on. The if you're the tallest out of 100 people, that does not make you twice as tall as the median person. Okay. Does not make you 100 times taller than the shortest. All it does, it gives you a ranking. In fact, you could imagine a situation where, <coughs> for all intents and purposes, everybody's more or less the same height. And yet you could rank them. Let's say there's a centimeter difference between them. Uh, there's no way in which we would say the tallest was, and let's say there are a thousand of them, uh, the tallest a thousand times taller than the uh, shortest of them. Okay. We'll use, we'll look at lots of ranking data over time. Then there are label data. These will turn out to be crucially important to us. Did you go to school? Okay. This is coded as one if you went to school, zero otherwise. It's simply a label. I could have made it zero if you went to school, one otherwise. And the information in that would be just the same as long as I give you a dictionary. This is called one hot coded, one hot encoded, if it's zero one. On the other hand, the same information could be minus 1,000 if school and 22.5 otherwise. As long as I've told you that, then you know exactly what's going on there. And the order, the magnitude of those things are useless. You don't need them. Sex, we'll run into this a lot. One if male, zero if female, zero if male, one if female. They're called dummy variables or indicator variables. Purchased. One if you purchase something, zero if not. We'll also see one if you purchase something, minus one if not. They both give you the same info as long as you have the dictionary. Discrete unordered. Look at continuous discrete. So this is something you probably have never seen before. This is a question, how many of each unit did you buy and how much in total did you spend? So that would be a discrete, how many of each unit and a continuous, what's the total that you spent? Here's another one. Did you buy anything at all? That's discrete. One if purchased, minus one if otherwise. If you purchased, how many units did you buy or how much did you spend? Are you in the labor force? If so, how much did you work? So whether you're not in the labor force or not in the labor force is a different question from how much you worked. And in fact, you could out of the labor force, you're not working. And you could be in the labor force, but you don't have a job, you're looking and you have zero hours of work. These are very different kinds of data than I think you're used to. And we will learn how to handle all of them. And as you can see, things that have to do with whether or not you purchase and how much you purchase, that's very important in retail. Uh, whether or not you work and how much you work, that's really important in labor economics and so on. I'll give you an uh, industrial organization one. Uh, you have a, uh, a number of places you locate. That's a discrete choice. And then having located there, you decide how much to produce and how to do it. 
And so I would observe where you located and how much you produced. And for things like determining where uh, uh, Nike uh, puts a factory or Nike puts a uh, warehouse and how to make that warehouse, those are really important kinds of questions. And if you're going to use statistics, you have to have models that can handle those things. And so we will show how to do that. Uh, <coughs> we will be trying to find relationships between data. Okay. So demand is a function of its own price, prices of substitutes and complements and socioeconomic features. And so we'll be looking at, you know, demand is a function of other things. Regression type models, we try to find relationships to the form y equals f of x, where x is a vector. The vector would have your own price, the price of substitutes, the prices of confidence, socioeconomic features, anything that might conceivably that you can measure affect demand. And we'll be trying to find those relationships. Y here in a regression type model will be cardinal and X is a vector of explanatory variables. The components of X are called features. I've not seen that one before. So in machine learning, what you call an independent variable is called a feature. They're called independent variables. They're called exogenous variables. They're sometimes called carrier variables. The dependent variables can be either continuous or discrete, uh, but not unordered. So these are going to be all ordered for the time being. I will be called the dependent variable, the response variable, or an endogenous variable, and it will also be called the target. variable. So you talk to a machine learner and you're talking about your model and they said, so what's your target? They're talking about your dependent variable. Dependent variables are labels. A dependent variable is a label we're trying to explain the label. What influences going to school? What influences whether or not you purchase a big screen TV or not? What influences which TV if you've got one? These are called classification problems as opposed to regression problems. Key thing here is the target is a label. The dependent variable is a label. It's unordered. When there's more than one class, more than one possible label. These are called multi-class problems. So typically classification is just zero one. You're in one group or another group. And so when somebody says classification, did you go to school? Didn't you go to school? What are the uh, uh, variables that influence that? Multi-class problems are, uh, did you go to school? If you went to school, did you go to an Ivy League school? If you went to an Ivy League school, was it Brown? Was it Yale? Blah, 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 blah. Did you go to a four-year state college? If it was a four-year state college, did you go to your uh, uh, in-state or out-of-state? If you went to in-state, was it whatever? If it was out-of-state, whatever, and so on. And so you can have lots of <coughs> unordered uh, responses. So I could make uh, Harvard uh, be a one and University of Washington be a 22 and Yale 109. And there's no sense in which those numbers have anything to do with the quality of the schools or anything. They're simply labels. And as long as you have a dictionary that says, well, oh, if it says 22, that means Washington. <coughs> then you should be fine. By the way, I do not have COVID. I just have this 
clock that's been driving me nuts since before COVID. So which school did you go to? Which of the many possible occupations did you choose? So this is stuff labor economists worry about. In regression problems, we want to learn that f of x. Remember y equals f of x. Why? f of uh, x provides a predictor. By the way, you notice I said the term learn, okay? In the past, you probably said, oh, we want to estimate f of x. Well, here we want to learn. And so learn and estimate are pretty close to the same thing. Not necessarily exactly the same thing, but for this cl course, close enough that when I say statistical learning, you suddenly go, oh, are you just saying we're going to learn how to estimate stuff? Yep, that's what I'm saying. So why do we want to learn F? Well, it turns out that F oftentimes provides a predictor. Think of doing ordinary least squares, and you get the predicted value. That predicts what the uh, uh, value of Y is going to be if X is some given number. It can also answer these kinds of questions. If we change x by delta x, how much will y change? That is, I can write um, a change in f uh, in essentially total differential form. That is, uh, the change in f is the sum of the change in x1 times the amount F1, uh, x1 changes by, plus the change in x2 times the amount that uh, F will change when x2 changes, and so on. And so you have a sum of the partial derivatives of F with respect to each the x's, and multiply by how much x changes. Now, you've done this with linear. It works for nonlinear as well. What does it mean to predict? Okay, here's a reg regression case. F hat generates a prediction, or generates predictions. We'll call them y hats. Okay. What that means is you tell me x, and I will guess y. And I will guess y by plugging it into f hat, by plugging x into f hat. That is, y hat is going to be equal to f of x hat. So I have learned f hat. That means regardless of x, I can go and plug it in, and that's going to give me a prediction. We think initially of f hat as a black box. And as we get further on in the course, you're going to see they really are black boxes. Okay. What we care about is how good a guess y hat is. So this is kind of the dream has to say. That's really all you care about, at least initially. How good a guess uh, uh, y hat is. How do you measure how it is? How do you measure how good a, an estimate is? A prediction, okay? How do we know what f of x is? Sometimes domain knowledge and science will tell us that is, oh, that's not f hat x, that's f x. How do you know what the underlying ground truth is? Okay. How do you know that functional form? Remember, we have y equals f of x plus an error. Okay. Uh, how do we know what that f of x is? Okay. Sometimes domain knowledge and science tells us, but sometimes it's harder than that. Uh, here's an example that I want to point something out to you. The expected, no, oh, this is wrong, this should be three. The expected uh, value of a number of dots on a fair and fairly tossed die is three. Okay. 
Uh, that's the f of x, okay? And there's no doubt about that. You don't need to estimate that if you have a fair die. You know that's going to be the case. Uh, that's a perfect model. That being said, if I toss this die, you cannot tell me what sides come up. One might come up, six might come up, four might come up. They'll all come up uh, with equal probability. That's what the error gives you. And so even if you have a perfect model, that is you perfectly get f of x, you can't get rid of that error unless you know, you're lucky and there's no error at all. Uh, but that rarely happens. So more generally, we have to estimate and that should be or learn f of x. What does it mean to predict for classification? You tell me x, and I will predict the label of the output. So you give me all of your uh, uh, characteristics, and I will predict uh, where you're going to go to college, or I'm going to predict what occupation you're going to choose, and so on. For one hot coding or encoding of a response, I have this. My black box takes your characteristics, which are a vector in RP, and maps it into a zero or a one. And so if it's a zero, let's say that means you're not going to school. A one says you are going to school. So I would plug your characteristics into this black box and it would give me a zero or a one. That would be the prediction. <clears throat> what are the building blocks for prediction? Well, the first thing is we need observations. Okay? We need observations because we're going to have to learn. Okay? And I'm going to say this right up front. This is really important. We're going to split data into two sets, a training set and a test set. Now, you probably haven't done that in the past. In the past, you got a set of data. You analyzed the whole set of data. And you looked at measures of error that we'll call in-sample. And it turns out that that has led to a huge, huge number of mistakes on the part of economists, social scientists, uh, uh, biotech people, and the like. And it's something that the machine learners really taught us. We kind of knew we were supposed to split data in the past, but for those of you who do macro, uh, you know, what's the longest macro series you've seen? you know, maybe a hundred years. And if it's a hundred years, I say, gosh, you know, do you really want to treat World War I and the depression and World War II and the 60s and uh, the Vietnam War period and uh, the uh, uh, financial collapse and COVID, do you want to treat them all the same? And you, let's say you say no, then I say, well, then you don't even have one year's worth of macro data post-COVID. Uh, and so you're so strapped for data, you didn't break things up in training and tests. I regularly work with sets that will have uh, a million and a half independent variables and four or five billion observations. And you can easily break those up into training and test sets. And so this is something that we're gonna emphasize in this course, okay? And the goal is to estimate F hat of X given the training data. So the training data are the, are what you're going to use to fit your model or estimate your model. <clears throat> uh, 
Then we need a concrete mechanism to measure how good the estimates are. That is, we need a loss function that penalizes the predictor for being wrong. And we'll denote that by L of Y and Y hat. And if that's zero, then you have a perfect predictor. There's no loss. That would be the situation where when you toss the die, your uh, mechanism tells you accurately what actually is going to show up. That rarely happens. Here's an example of a loss function. Uh, we have the expected value of y minus y hat squared, which you've seen in the past, OK? Note that if y is equal to f of x plus an error, and y hat equals f of x, that is, you know f of x, you haven't had to learn it, then the variance of of epsilon is the only uh, is sigma squared, and that's the only source of error. Okay, that is your loss will be equal to the variance of the error. Here's the problem: you, we will see that is as low as you can get. You can never get rid of that. That's the same thing as saying you can never get rid of that error when you toss the die even though you know it's equally likely and you, you know that the expected value of the die is absolutely three, you're still not going to be able to uh, get around what we're going to call the irreducible error later on. <clears throat> so we choose y hat, so, uh, and I now am going to, uh, uh, say it depends on x, just so I don't have to keep writing so much. So as to minimize, I'm, so that we minimize the expected loss or the empirical loss. So for example, in a sample, I would have yi, here's my predictor. I haven't said how I've gotten it yet, okay? Uh, and I take the residuals, I square them, sum them, and divide by n. So that is a uh, mean square error. My y hats come from my black box, which I've learned. OK, so uh, I've learned f hat. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take xi. I'm going to plug it into f hat. And then I'm going to look at the yi. Going to take the squared residuals, divide by n. And that gives me a mean square error. Notation. Okay. I'm assuming you've seen this before. The expected value of y, if y is discrete, is the sum of the possible values of y times their probability sum. That is, you take each probability, you multiply it by y, and then you sum over all values. Okay? That's the expected value if y is discrete. If y is continuous, let's let a be the set of all possible values I can take on. And then it's the density times y integrated with respect to y. Okay. <clears throat> I will give you a better notation later. Okay. I know that the density of y is the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. And we're going to need that in a few minutes. Here's an aside. Uh, you don't technically need this, this course. 
Uh, I bring it up here because if you read any machine learning article, you're going to see this notation. And rather than having it have you throw it, you don't need to know the details. It's really just a notation. It's painful to write out the different forms all the time. Okay. Recall from total different the total differential from calculus. Oops. So the total differential from calculus is df of y equals f prime y dy, which equals f of y dy. So this is the total differential of the cumulative distribution function. This is the derivative times dy, and this is just the density, which is the derivative times dy. Okay. If I substitute that into the formula for an expected value, this f of y dy becomes d f y. And so when you see that, just think, oh, they're just doing a regular old integral. And uh, this is just called the Stilchis form. Now, if this is all that was going on, uh, we wouldn't even bother talking about it, but there's something else we can do here. For discrete random variables, define df of y as the probability, that is it's pi if y equals y sub i. Um, so e of y is Take each value of y, multiply it by its probability and sum. Okay. Now, with the definition I just gave you of dfy for discrete random variable, note that pi is dfy. And so now I would write e of y equals the summation i equals one through k, y i d f y. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite that sum as an integral. I'm going to say, if it turns out this is a discrete random variable, then your integral here is really a sum. And your d f y's here are really probabilities. And your y's are your y's. And what this means is I can use the same notation for discrete and for continuous. And in fact, when we talk about continuous and discrete random variables, uh, I can use the same notation for those as well. <coughs> so if a random variable is continuous, the expected value is a standard integral. If the random variable is discrete, this is simply a sum. In the Stilchis forms, sum becomes integrals. And that's, that's all you need to really remember about this. <coughs> now, the special distribution. I'm assuming that you've seen the empirical distribution function for the empirical CDF. So let's yi, i equals one through n, be a random sample from a population with a cumulative distribution function fy. Doesn't have to be continuous, doesn't have to be discrete. The empirical cumulative distribution function is simply this. It's the number of y's that are less than or equal to y divided by how many observations they are. It's the fraction of sample that has a value less than or equal to y. That's what the empirical cumulative distribution function is. And interestingly, it turns out to be a pretty good estimate of the population cumulative distribution function. That is, it's a good estimate of f of y. 
I can also define something like a derivative. This really isn't a derivative, okay? I say that d f y is one over m, okay? If y equals y i and is zero otherwise. And then I'm gonna write the sample average as an integral. Hence, E n of y is the integral over all possible values of y. Oops, that should be a dfn. dfn of y. Okay, where dfn is discrete. Okay, so what that means is that the integral becomes a sum and dfy becomes 1 over n, and the yi's become discrete. That's simply sum of the y's over n, and that's just the mean. And so oftentimes you will see the mean written as en of y. And you'll see that throughout machine learning papers. And it's just assumed that coming up through that literature, you learn that first, and then you learn the y bar later on. The second building block. So the first building block is, is our data. Uh, the second building block uh, is our model, okay? And here are the kinds of models we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at parametric models. So we're gonna have f of x and beta is a known function of x and beta, but beta is unknown, okay? So I know the functional form f, I just don't know what the beta is. So in a standard regression, we have y equals beta zero plus uh, xi transpose beta, where beta is a vector, okay? Uh, in this case, I know f is linear. Here's my error. Uh, and the only thing I don't know is I don't know what the betas are. I could look at a Cobb-Douglas production function. So some, I'm sure some of you have seen this. So y is uh, a function. These would be you know, various kinds of capital, various kinds of labor. And this is basically a geometric average plus an error. In this case, again, you know the functional form. You know it's a geometric average. You just don't know what beta zero and the various betas are. Or maybe you could have something like that. The reason I write that is it turns out if you get the logarithm of both sides of that, you can convert it into linear regression. In the previous one, you cannot. Why? Because log of something plus something else is not a log, is a sum of logs. So for parametric models, you pick a model, maybe a regression model. And then you estimate its parameters by minimizing a loss function. So standard regression, it's easy to interpret. We know uh, that delta F is uh, equal to beta one times the change in X one, beta two times the change in X two, all the way up to beta P times the change in X P. If Delta X2 to delta XP are all equal to zero, then B1 uh, is uh, delta F uh, over delta X1. That is, it tells you how much F will change if X1 changes. Okay. If only XK is not equal to zero, then DF, D, or delta F, delta XK is equal to the the uh, uh, case component, okay? So linear parametric models are very easy to interpret and that's why we use them. As you will see at the end of the lecture, that 
that interpretability comes at a huge cost, a huge cost. Okay. Okay, now we've chosen the model. That is, we've said our model is going to be a linear model, and now we have to pick the parameters. And what we do is uh, we uh, pick beta one through beta p to minimize the sum of the squared residuals. That's ordinary least squares. That's what you did in 482. That's pretty much what that whole course is about. What about non-parametric models? In non-parametric models, f is arbitrary. Remember we have y equals f of x plus an error. And now f is arbitrary. It's not linear. We don't know the functional form, okay? Doesn't depend on unknown parameters. It's even worse than that. The form is completely unknown. And what we we'll wanna do, let's take a case in which there are two, just x1 and x2. We want to find the f that minimizes those residuals. So here's y, here's my prediction. Take the difference, square it, sum up. And what I want to do is I want to find an F that minimizes that. That can be very hard. In fact, without more structure, it's impossible. What might be more structure? Well, maybe F is smooth. Maybe it's something else. But without any structure, that problem is not solvable. Where are you going to get the structure? You're going to get it from domain knowledge. Then there are semi-parametric models. Okay. A semi-parametric model is f of x is a function h of g of x beta, where g of x beta is parametric. Okay, So I know the functional form. I just don't know what the betas are. So for example, g of x beta could be linear regression, okay? Typically, H will be smooth but arbitrary. It'll be univariate. And what we'll try to do is we will try to estimate the betas and the Hs. <clears throat> this problem isn't as hard, but it's still very, very hard. Okay. So we're going to find the h and the beta that minimizes. And again, here we have a residual y minus our predictor. Square them, sum them, and then choose a beta and the h that minimizes that. Okay. Here's some pros and cons. Parametric models are easy to interpret but they tend not to be very accurate. Unless you're lucky, there are things that turn out to be actually linear. More often than not, we're going to find things are not actually linear. They're only approximately so, and maybe not well approximately so. Parametric models will tend to be biased, and we're going to talk a lot about this later on. And you might say, well, wait a minute. I thought if the Gauss-Markov assumptions held, you got unbiased estimates. And the answer is true, because you've assumed your model was linear. But let's say now you don't know your model is linear, and you're saying, well, I'm just taking that as an approximation. Well, then you're going to have a bias, and the bias is going to come from whatever your approximation is. And we'll talk about that a lot later on. Non-parametric models, highly accurate. They tend to uh, be uninterpretable or hard to interpret. They also tend to have high variances. They have low biases and high variances. 
you need lots and lots and lots of observations to get them. Okay. They also tend to be computationally expensive. You know, a small regression, even a large regression, uh, might take you know, a few seconds, maybe a few minutes. A deep learning neural net might take months to train. Um, you know, if you need to know, uh, if you need a prediction of where the COVID uh, 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 is going to be, you don't want to have to wait for months until the thing's over uh, to say, ah, if we'd already know, uh, already, uh, if we'd only known, we could have this, 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 and this. So the computational expense of either because it takes a long time or it takes a lot of, of uh, computing power or both. Okay. Why not choose the flexible and accurate model? Okay. One can oftentimes give up some accuracy for more interpretability. And uh, uh, we'll see that. I would say up until maybe two years ago, I always had two models. I would build a very accurate machine learning model that answered the question, what's the best prediction? And then I would have a less accurate, more interpretable uh, econometric model that would allow me to say, oh, well, it looks like if you change this, this will have that effect. We'll address this later on in the course. It brings us to the whole flexibility versus interoperability. Okay. Uh, I hope that's big enough to see. Um, I have over here uh, interoperability. And so these are highly interpretable and these are not very interpretable. Here I have flexibility. These are not very flexible. These are very, very flexible. And what you find are things like this. If you look at means, if you just use the mean, you don't actually have the underlying structure. Means are not very flexible at all, but they're quite interpretable. I mean, that's the first thing you learn how to interpret in a statistical course. Okay. Uh, Ordinary squares. Okay. Ordinary squares uh, are uh, less interpretable than means. Uh, so you to interpret. That's what you learned in, in your regression course. Uh, less than means. Okay. Uh, we will learn next time. We will talk about local regressions. We will find that they are uh, uh, flexible, uh, interpretable. I'm not sure I really want those there. I'm going to move this down later on. Uh, um, we'll have something called the lasso, which we're going to spend a lot of time with. This is going to solve a whole bunch of problems with ordinary least squares and other things. We will have things called generalized uh, additive models, which are in the equations of ordinary least squares. We will have trees, trees, random forests, boosted regressions. And uh, these are uh, quite flexible, but not very interpretable. Okay. Um, we'll have neural nets, deep learning. We'll find that those are almost completely uninterpretable. Uh, random force and boost regression with the variance of trees are even less interpretable. And probably the least interpretable are support vector machines. Support vector machines are just going to give you a prediction. And you say, well, what does it mean? And they're going to say, well, if you want to know what it means, you're going to have to use different methods. But they can 
to be very fast and give good uh, uh, solutions. So the point here, yes. Uh, so it seems like uh, you have some problem with your microphone and uh, it's, it has been a while. Like, what is that? Like a lot of, lot of students have a problem like the microphone, there may be something Oh, wrong. The, ma the microphone is not working? It's working right now, but like just before here, uh, it's not like work well. Okay, just just yell if it's not working, um, or uh, that's that's fine. So, uh, and it could be I put my hand over the microphone, which is not a good thing to do. Uh, so, um, uh, the point here is you notice that there is a flexibility interpretability trade-off. The more flexible things are, the less interpretable they'll be. And oftentimes, you have to trade this thing off, you have to make a decision which you want to use. We're also going to talk about uh, um, supervised versus unsupervised. Is, uh, is, it, is it flipping out again? I mean, We're going to talk about supervised versus unsupervised learning. With supervised learning, um, we want to predict a white key. Okay. We're going to have regression and classification problems. That is, number of bias purchased, what TB is, qualitative selection, et cetera. Uh, and the key thing with supervising is we're going to have a penalty for making a mistake. That is, uh, I'll be a uh, you made a mistake, and I'm going to penalize you. Okay? And so that's supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning. You have a target, and you have a prediction. You have a residual, you have a squared residual, and you get punished for making a mistake. Unsupervised learning, drivenness is no lies. And what you're oh, learning, nice. trying to do is find. Um, um, uh, so it's, it's still not, I mean, like, it's still, it does not work well. So it's still not working well. Let me try. Uh, hmm. Let me see what I can do here. I have to do some pairing here. In a second here.
How was that? <laughs> hmm. Hello. That sounds better. Um. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, this is not connected. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, let me, Okay, how is that? Can you hear me? That's a lot better. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see if we can. Uh, get back to. Uh, Okay, so uh, can everybody hear me now? Is this fine? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so <clears throat> given independent variables, we try to find latent patterns. So this includes things like clustering and what we'll eventually learn principal components analysis. Uh, it's the kind of thing where um, you look for anomalies. Um, so uh, a radiologist might look at a uh, 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 an X-ray and not be looking for anything particular, just be looking for something that looks weird. And that's kind of unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. Okay. One model fits all. So right now, the hot thing in machine learning is deep learning. Uh, and so, you know, people will ask me all the time, well, why don't you just use a deep learning model? And uh, it turns out no single model will fit all situations. There is a machine learning theorem called the no free lunch theorem. And I like it for economists because economists say all the time there are no free lunches. But the no free lunch theorem says that for uh, uh, that there is no single model that will be able to learn all possible uh, models. Okay. Um, also, we need to quantify fit by measuring accuracy. It turns out what we use to quantify fit is going to affect uh, what model we use. And you'll see that in the next lecture. Okay. The third building block of, of uh, uh, this analysis are loss functions or accuracy measures. So 
Measurements of fit in regression. Mean square error. That is, you take um, Whoops. Uh, go back here. You take the residual, you square it, and you sum it. We've just been talking about that, and that's what uh, 482 was all about. But here's a different. Uh, here's here's one that's related. This is the square root of the one above it. Okay. This is Pythagorean distance. So you can work either with the MSE or this, which is called the L2 norm. Here's something, the MAD. Now, here's the residual. But now instead of squaring it, I take an absolute value. And I sum that and I average it. That's called the mean absolute deviation. And a model that minimizes the mean square error will be different than a model that minimizes the absolute deviation. Interestingly, this is called the L1 norm. Okay, I don't have to take a square root of it because the one root of something uh, uh, just leaves it alone. More generally, we have so-called LP norms. That is, we will look at the residual, the absolute value. We will raise it to the P power with P greater than one, a zero, uh, greater than one. And then we will take the, uh, that should be the P root, not the one over P root, that's the P root. Okay. The L infinity norm is kind of interesting. You take the residual, you take the absolute value, and then you go through all your data and you find the maximum. And so you find the F that makes that maximum residual as small as possible. Which do you want to choose? And we're going to talk about that more in the next lecture. In fact, that's one of the things that the machine learners do wrong, in my opinion, is they will pick <coughs> a measure of accuracy that's easy to work with. And it may not be the one that's best for business. So now we're going to talk about generalization and out of sample. Okay. We can compute any of those on the training data, that is, any of those measures. But our goal is generalization. I don't want to know how well this works on my data set. I want to know how well it would work on similar data sets. That is, I want to quantify the fit on an unseen but similar test data set. How do I do that? We split the data into two parts. Train on one, test on the other. And we measure the error on the separate set, okay? The set used to estimate or train is called the training set. The set used to test the model is called the test or validation set. Let's give an example with a standard regression. You've seen this before. In a, an in sample R squared can be always driven to one by increasing the number of linearly independent explanatory variables. That is, even if they're random, okay, you can always increase the number of variables and your R squared will go up. Your in sample R squared, the one you measure when you do uh, uh, 
uh, ordinary least squares in R or theta or or anything. Okay. We don't want to use the in sample R squared. We want to use the out of sample R squared. Okay. Just mentioned something here. The usual formula for R squared is wrong out of sample. Okay. So the usual formula is R squared equals one minus the sum of squared residuals divided by essentially the variance. Well, except it's not divided by N. Uh, the uh, uh, squared deviations uh, uh, from the mean. It turns out you can show that for a regression, for a standard linear regression uh, in sample, that number is identical to the correlation of actual and fitted values squared. Interestingly, out of sample, that R squared formula is wrong, this one. However, this will still be correct. That is, those two numbers out of sample will not be the same. That is, the uh, 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 one minus residual squared over deviation squared uh, is not the same as the correlation between actual and fitted values squared. Note, by the way, here, I have the test here. Here, I should have had train. Why train? Okay. Now, as I said, I can drive the in sample R squared to zero simply by increasing the number of independent variables even if those variables are nonsense. That does not happen out of sample. That R squared will not go to one. In fact, it'll start getting worse. Uh, so, <clears throat> wanted to show you something here. This is your variance. This is your irreducible error variance, that red line. This is your in-sample MSE. And the thing I want to point out is the in-sample MSE can go to zero, okay? The out-of-sample MSE, as you get more flexible, what will happen is it will go down, and then it'll start going back up. So your out of sample uh, MSC will start going up, even though your in sample will go down. And so what you want to do is you want to find a model that does a good job out of sample. And so we'll spend a lot of time working with the uh, testing MSE rather than the training MSE. So it'll be completely different than what you work with in uh, 482. Beware of overfitting so that when you drive things in sample down to zero, that's usually considered overfitting. In sample overfits. You can make the error go to zero with a flexible enough model, and that's the in sample error. Note the out of sample error seems to have the correct shape. That is, as <coughs> the model becomes more flexible, your variance goes up. And we'll talk about this uh, uh, quite a bit more. So this illustrates overfitting. MSE training gives a perfect in sample fit with a flexible enough model that will fail disastrously out of sample. That is, if you take something that you didn't use to train and fit it, you will find you're way off, your residual is just huge. 
even though the MSC train is zero. The MSC test will be very high. Okay. The testing MSC gives you a very much better estimate of accuracy than the in sample. So now what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, an a, a, a equation that we're going to spend a huge amount of time on. Um, uh, this is not something you would need to do for a final, but I want you to see how it's done, particularly those of you who are going to go to grad school. <clears throat> Here is a squared residual, okay? And I can always plug y in. So y minus y hat is the expected value of y plus the error of that shouldn't be squared, but just the error, minus y hat quantity squared. And now what I can do is I can add and subtract the expected value of y hat minus y hat. That's zero, right? So that doesn't change anything. Now I can rearrange terms, okay? Uh, and what I can show is that that y hat minus, uh, that y minus y hat squared is the expected value of y minus the expected value of y hat squared, y hat minus the expected value of y hat squared, the error, and then cross terms. So I have uh, the expected value of y minus y hat times the error, the expected value of y minus y hat times y hat minus e of y, and whoops, and that. So just take just take this thing, rearrange it, and do the squares, and you're going to get that. Now that's going to simplify a whole bunch. Take the expected value of both sides, okay? The first term, you get this plus this plus this. The second term, you get this. Now, the thing I want to point out is when you take expected values, that's going to be a constant. That's going to, that expected value is going to be zero. Similarly, this is a constant. And that's going to be zero too. That is the expected value of random variable minus the expected value is going to be equal to zero. Similarly here, okay. And uh, you can you can read this. I want to get to the punchline. The punchline is this. That is, the expected value of y minus y hat squared can be written as the squared difference in the expected value of y hat and the expected value of y. It turns out that's the bias squared. This is the variance. That is, take y, take a random variable, subtract off its expected value, square it, take the expected value of that, that gives you the predictor variance, and then you have your variance of your error. That's gonna be called the irreducible error variance. So that any mean square error can be broken up into a bias squared, a predictor variance, and a irreducible error variance. It also works if the expectations are conditional expectations. I'll jump over that. You will get conditional bias equals conditional predictor bias plus conditional irreducible error variance. I said bias and variance. So MSE, can be written as 
bias squared predictor variance plus the irreducible error variance. Bias squared and predictor variance, those can be driven to zero with a good enough model. You get rid of the bias, you can get rid of the predictor variance. You can't get rid of the error variance. You're gonna be stuck with that no matter what. For the first part of the course, <coughs> <clears throat> we're going to be uh, interested in what's called the variance bias trade-off. That is, we're going to be looking at that. I don't want you to forget that, that there will be an irreducible error variance there that we simply cannot get rid of. So even though I'm concentrating on this part, uh, I don't want you to forget that. So let's take a look at the variance bias trade-off. So down here we have flexibility, okay? Here I have sigma, okay? Okay. Here I have the bias squared, And you note that as the flexibility goes up, the bias drops. Here I have the variance of the prediction. You notice as the flexibility goes up, the variance goes up, okay? And when I add those together, I get this. I get the mean square error, okay? And what I want to do is I want to pick models that minimize this mean square error. So in this case, I would come and I would say, I want a model that's that flexible. Now, flexibility is going to mean different things in different contexts, and we will see a lot of that. Um, finally, uh, I'll point out that flexible models tend to have low bias and high variance. Okay. Um, I've got to pull this out. I, I, that's in the wrong spot. Okay. So it will turn out that things like random forests and support vector machines have very high variances, but very low biases. What that means is that to get that low bias and have a variance that you can live with, you're going to need a huge amount of data. And finally, uh, with uh, about 20 minutes to go, uh, that's as far as I got. So uh, next time we'll come back and I will talk about uh, quantiles and why you need them. And then I will give you your first, sorry, I will give you your first um, uh, machine learning model. That is, we will talk about what are called uh, nearest neighbor estimators or local estimators. And one of the things I wanna emphasize here is while all you need to know is the technique, and I could just go and say, here's the technique, learn it. Uh, I would like you to see kind of intellectually how the first person who was developing these things might have gone about doing that. And so uh, I'll spend a fair amount of time on uh the local methods uh and kind of explaining why it is you should find this sensible now one of the things i will mention is that except for neural nets we will be able to convert almost any model we look at into a linear regression And uh, we're going to utilize that. Now, 
it oftentimes isn't the case computationally that you would want to do that. And that will certainly be true with the local regressions. Nonetheless, I can convert a local regression into a linear least squares. <coughs> what I would like you to do uh, uh, for next time, as well as what I've mentioned here, is I would like you to uh, remind yourself what dummy variable regressions look like. And, uh, uh, and I will use uh, stuff on dummy variable regressions. I will remind you that if you have a dummy variable regression, oftentimes you drop one of the dummies or you drop the intercept so as to avoid multicollinearity. That will turn out to be important and we'll talk about it next time. Uh, and uh, uh, so this, uh, uh, this model will be uh, relatively flexible, uh, uh, have a, a low bias. Uh, it will turn out to be uh, uh, fairly interpretable but they tend to have huge variances for reasons that you will see. Uh, so um, that is my first online lecture I've ever given. And I hope uh, it was better than I think it was. I would much prefer to be doing this on a whiteboard uh, in front of a class. Okay, uh, we'll see you next time. And uh, if you have any questions, Herbert can handle them. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, sign off now. Uh, Herbert, do you want to stay on for a bit and uh, handle any questions? Yeah, oh, sure. Okay. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, let's see. If I turn this off since you're co-host, uh, it won't go away, right? Um, let's see. Uh, and I want to... Uh, Stop sharing. And uh, now I'm going to end the meeting. I'm going to leave the meeting. Um, so um, this will be the end of this lecture, and uh, if you have questions, just let me know.